Welcome back to another ATSF Slate and Subdivision video. In a divergence from my videos past, it is a pleasure to share this unique opportunity to look at late 1970s branch line railroading in Midwestern Ontario in HO scale. Prototype photos and operations will complement a tour of what is really a club sized model railroad, faithfully depicting the rural landscape and industries in the fading years of Canadian National's expansive branch line network. This network reached the shores of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay in Ontario, Canada. This model railroad covers nearly 1,500 square feet in at least two levels and often three or four levels. It focuses on CN's operations out of Stratford, Ontario. While the focus of the layout and the operations is on the branch line network, mainline traffic is well represented on what was CN's North Main, the Thorndale and Guelph subdivisions. Today, the North Main is known as the Guelph subdivision. It is this traffic from CN's Macmillan Yard in Toronto and CN's Yard in London that feeds the layout's customers. Also included are the passenger train operations that serve the North Main. This map provides an overview of the branch line network north of London, Ontario, as it existed in 1977. CN lines that are modeled are in black, including the names of towns served on the layout. The light gray lines are other CN mains and branches that are unmodeled. CP Rail shows up in red, and those operations are not modeled in the layout other than portions of the CP Rail's Goderich subdivision between Guelph and Goderich. To even partially realize the amount of real estate required, the layout does a great job of stretching out through long peninsulas over multiple levels. Operators working in remote branch lines may go an hour without bumping into other operators. And that is impressive as the layout can easily handle 15 to 20 operators to complete all the required work. We start our tour looking at CN's North Main and we'll begin at London, Ontario, the Western staging yard on the layout. The Thorndale subdivision ran some 31 miles north of London to Stratford, Ontario, and is today part of CN's Guelph subdivision. Starting at the large yard at London, we follow the railroad north to the sidings at Kelly's near Belton. Then, as we round the curve into St. Mary's, we pass Canada Packers, and then the spur into St. Mary's Cement. Continuing north, north through St. Mary's, the tracks duck under Queen Street and by the station before crossing Trout Creek on a long trestle. A branch diverges west at St. Mary's Junction. This is the Forest Subdivision, which was once CN's main line to Sarnia, and ultimately through the Grand Trunk to Chicago. Service at this time was down to only several days a week. A moderately sized and busy yard is located at the division point of Stratford, a small city in rural Perth County. This was the focal point of all operations on CN's Midwestern Ontario branch lines during the late 1970s. So at this time, Stratford, a railway city by right, was once home to a major steam locomotive repair shops, which have been quiet since the disappearance of steam. Nonetheless, late 1970s Stratford was still a busy place, seeing upwards of two dozen arrivals and departures most days. We take a quick glance at the west end of Stratford and follow the Thorndale subdivision back towards St. Mary's. This quick look shows some of the industries that existed on the west end of Stratford. Back at Stratford Yard, we see some photographs of the prototype and modeled engine terminal. 
The yard received and originated two pairs of manifests to and from Toronto each day. These trains were number 455, 456, 457, and 458, along with train number 558, a transfer job to London Yard. It was these trains that provided the traffic to Stratford that served the branch line network. The North Main also saw 10 passenger arrivals and departures at Stratford each day. Eight of these trains ran the length of the route from London to Toronto, while a trio of RDCs ran between Stratford and Toronto. Aside from number 558, way freight number 555 served the Thorndale and Forest subdivision out of Stratford. The Forest subdivision is mostly unmodeled in the layout. Another regular freight on the Thorndale subdivision was the oil train from Corona near Sarnia to Douglas Point on a spur off the Southampton subdivision and a subsequent return train of empties in the opposite direction. At this time, the line typically saw two or three loaded oil trains per week with a corresponding number of empty trains. Additional traffic east out of Stratford on the North Main was the Elmira Turn, which worked Shakespeare, New Hamburg, Kitchener, and finally Elmira. East out of Stratford Yard begins the Guelph Subdivision, again, part of today's Guelph Subdivision as well. We'll pick up the Guelph Subdivision starting in the east at Toronto Staging, which represents Macmillan Yard and Toronto Union Station, both of which are well beyond the actual Guelph Subdivision. As the railroad moves west out of Toronto, the first major city that is represented is Guelph. Guelph was a busy place in the 1970s with numerous rail-served industries and was an important junction between the Fergus Subdivision and the Guelph Subdivision. At the time of these operations on the layout, direct service to Palmerston was discontinued on the Fergus subdivision due to a condemned bridge. The Fergus sub also ran south through Galt in what is now the city of Cambridge. We'll come back to that operation. Continuing west, the railroad parallels Ontario Highway 7 for a short distance to the city of Kitchener. The line passes over Highway 85, often referred to as the Expressway, by the locals. Kitchener Yard and the Weston Bakery mark the east end of Kitchener. This is one busy place, and it could be imagined that the crossing gates at Lancaster Street were never up for long. At Kitchener Station, we see the usual yard power tied up that handles the local switching and will work down the Huron Park Spur to Bud Automotive and interchange with CP. Pause. West out of Kitchener, we pass several industries and in the foreground, what would be the curve onto the Huron Park Spur. Continuing west, the Leo passes through New Hamburg before crossing the Nith River. Shakespeare is next before a long stretch of track into the east end of Stratford Yard. The east end of the Stratford Yard is bounded by the Romeo Street underpass. The yard itself is relatively short, but quite wide. This necessitated a central access on the layout, 
which could be used to keep most of the yard and turnouts within reach of the Stratford yard job. The modeled yard configuration faithfully represents the actual yard trackage on the prototype with some slight modifications for space, of course. Before we move on from the North Main, we'll follow an RDC train east from Shakespeare through New Hamburg to the Kitchener Station. Making up time, the RDCs continue east at track speed out of Kitchener towards Guelph. At Guelph, we'll take a short trip south along the Fergus subdivision. The model portion of this subdivision only extends to Galt and services the Galt Industrial Park. The prototype will continue on to join the Dundas subdivision at Linden Junction. Other than the way freight on this line, the only other train to regularly use this track was a turn of piggyback trailers between Guelph and Linden Junction. At the time of the filming, we were fortunate to catch a switch job working in the Galt Industrial Park. The North Main, not being the focus of the layout, is in itself an operational masterpiece. But now we leave the hurried pace behind and explore the branches out of Stratford. And we'll start with the Goderich subdivision. The Goderich subdivision runs nearly 46 miles west of Stratford to Goderich and is the only remaining branch line out of Stratford in operation as of 2024. It is also the oldest, dating back to 1858. This and a portion of the Exeter subdivision are currently owned and operated by Genesee and Wyoming's Goddard and Exeter Railway. Operations during the late 1970s consisted of a Stratford to Goddard way freight that would depart Stratford in the morning and arrive midday in Goddard, returning back to Stratford in the afternoon. Online business consisted primarily of agricultural products, building supplies, salt, and road graders. As depicted by this March 2024 video, salt and agricultural products still dominate the traffic on this line.
Following along the middle deck, the layout passes through what would be Mitchell, which at this time was yet to be modeled. Continuing west, the prototype passed through other small rural towns such as Seaforth and Clinton, where there was a junction with the Exeter subdivision. Finally, the railway continued west towards the shores of Lake Huron at Goderich. At Goderich, the CN tracks swing north across Highway 8 before passing the Domtar Siftel Salt Evaporator Plant, Champion Road Graders, and into the yard. Right up until the sale of the line, CN kept a yard crew in Goderich to handle movements to and from the harbour right up until Goderich Exeter's takeover in 1992. Crews would make numerous trips up and down the 4% grade through the day due to weight restrictions. At the west end of the Goderich Yard, the line passed a freight house and loading tracks for champion road graders, and then the old boarding yard, which sat precariously perched over the Maitland River. Passing under the CPR bridge, sea and trackage split at the harbour to serve the grain elevators and the salt mine. At the time, the mine was switched by CN but provided service to both CN and CP. It wasn't until the last days of CP operations in Goderich that the contracts were switched to CN. The interchange with CP can be seen across the harbour. From the interchange tracks, Canadian Pacific trackage swings on a very tight curve at the beach towards CP's Goderich Station. Even after steam had disappeared, the turntable was still in use as CP often ran solo power on the Goderich job. Heading east out of Goderich, we see the backside of the elevators of the harbour. The line itself is not modeled, and the 79-mile run to Guelph extends about 30 more feet to CP staging in Guelph. Heading back to Stratford, we follow a work extra east out of Goderich through the eyes of the operator. Once we're back in Stratford, we'll head north into the heart of rural Ontario. It is now that we really step back in time and follow the branches north of Stratford. 
Today, these lions are but distant memories with only fragments of the rights of ways visible to those actually looking for it. Many of these have been turned into trails. In the 1970s, the Newton subdivision was the rail gateway into Midwestern Ontario. It ran 36.5 miles north across Perth County to Palmerston and met the Owen Sound subdivision at the Palmerston Yard. As the main artery of these branch lines, we'll follow the Owen Sound subdivision to its namesake town and deep Great Lakes Harbour on Georgian Bay. The Newton subdivision runs north out of Stratford and through mostly flat, wide open farmland, with one major exception, the Ellis Swamp, which it bisects. What is arguably the rail fans highlight on the route is the CP rail flyover just north of Milverton. Listowel on the Newton subdivision is the most populous town between Stratford and Owen Sound. It is also the junction with the King Carden subdivision and a past connection with Canadian Pacific. Several trackside industries were located here along with the team track. For a rural branch line, the Newton subdivision saw a fair number of trains. Depending on the various branch jobs out of Stratford and the oil trains, it was not unheard of for four or five trains to traverse the branch in a single day. Train 553 East went north out of Stratford to Owen Sound, and train 554 ran south out of Owen Sound. The total run was 107 miles, plus any side trips on the branches. These trains would typically meet somewhere on the Owen Sound subdivision. And these trains would run five to six days per week with train B-553 running as required from Stratford as well. B-553 served the Kincardine subdivision, Southampton subdivision, and on very rare occasions would serve the Durham Spur. The Newton subdivision terminated at the once busy division point of Palmerston, Ontario. Palmerston's heyday was the 1940s and 1950s, when dozens of passenger, mixed, and freight trains called on the yard. As the road network expanded and improved into Midwestern Ontario, the writing was on the wall for the future of railways throughout Huron, Perth, Wellington, Gray, and Bruce counties. The last train hauled by steam to visit Palmerston was in 1959. The branches in and out of Palmerston had remained a stronghold of steam right up until this time. The most identifiable feature in Palmerston was the long iron pedestrian bridge that spanned the yard. This will provide some sense of the immensity of the yard and the importance of the railway to the history of Palmerston. The bridge still stands today. As an old division point, Palmerston Yard connected the Newton subdivision with the Owen Sound subdivision. Heading north out of Palmerston on the Owen Sound subdivision, the railway passes White's Junction, where the spur to Durham connected. We'll return to the sleepy Durham Spur later in the video. For now, the railway continues north to the farming town of Harriston. While business might have been slow when this was filmed, Harriston relied on rail service right up until the line's abandonment. There was also a crossing with CP's Teeswater subdivision to Wingham. On the northwest edge of town is Harriston Junction, where the Southampton subdivision split. Waiting to enter onto the Owen Sound subdivision is an empty oil train from Douglas Point. The next sizable town north of Harriston is Hanover. 
The New Life Mills was the most prominent feature in Hanover and is very accurately depicted on the layout. And the maze of tracks also cross CP's Walkerton line. Linear compression is necessary to cover the 45 miles to Owen Sound. The giant elevators at the Owen Sound Harbor loom over the railway's entrance into the town, the yard, and the interchange with CP's Owen Sound subdivision. CP Rail's Owen Sound subdivision connected Owen Sound with the Galt subdivision main line in Streetsville, which is now part of the city of Mississauga. Major traffic sources to Owen Sound in the 1970s was grain and industrial goods. CP Rail would even run occasional grain trains on the Owen Sound line. The switching of the grain was actually handled by Canadian National Crews. None of the CP trackage or operations were modeled on the layout. Another branch that reached the shores of Lake Huron was the King Carden subdivision. The King Carden line ran 58 miles from Listowel to where Beachfront Station once stood. Even in the 1970s, traffic was sparse. The line's first abandonment was in 1983 when service ended between Wingham and King Carden. Service to Wingham ultimately lasted until 1991 and the last rails on the line were lifted in 1993. Following the King Carton branch in the layout, we travel south at Listowel for a short distance. The line is briefly hidden in a helix before merging at the small village of Atwood. The next town that is modeled on the line is Wingham. This was really the last stronghold of traffic on the branch prior to the abandonment. Heading west out of Wingham, the line crosses the Maitland River. The line ducks away and actually fits narrowly between the uppermost deck and the lowest deck. As the line approaches King Carton, it first passes the old Y. The yard in King Carton was very small, consisting only of a few tracks of light rail with little use. A further headache to CN was the constant battle with the drifting sands along the shores of Lake Huron. Running almost parallel to the King Carton subdivision, and at sometimes only about 15 miles apart, the 53.5 mile Southampton subdivision connected communities in rural Bruce County to CN's network and again, Ontario's west coast at Lake Huron. We begin the tour of the line at Douglas Point, situated on Lake Huron, on what is more accurately known as the Douglas Point Spur. Traffic on the line was given a boost in the 1970s thanks to the Bruce nuclear power development. The Y to Southampton is suggested, but extremely low traffic levels meant that the town itself was not modeled. The next town to the east, as represented on the layout, is Walkerton. A very narrow shelf takes the railway to the Owen Sound subdivision at Harriston Junction. Traffic typical to the Bruce nuclear power plant are seen in the following two examples. The first 
is this empty oil train led by five units heading east. Another load typical of Ontario Hydro's needs were transformers, as seen in this depressed center flat car. The last revenue train to polish these rails was in 1989. This brings us to the final line model on this expansive layout, and it is the Durham Spur. This spur left the Owens Sound subdivision at White's Junction and ran almost 26 miles to Durham in Gray County. Traffic levels during the late 1970s only warranted a train or two every month. We were fortunate enough to capture a picture of one of these trains as it heads south into Palmerston. We start at the end of the line in Durham, whose tracks sit empty and then head south towards Mount Forest. Unit gravel trains were a mainstay right into the 1960s. But as can be seen here in the late 1970s, traffic on this line was nearly non-existent. Alas, all good things must come to an end, and so did service to this rail network north of Stratford. The last revenue freight to ply the rails occurred on the Newton subdivision in 1995. The rails were lifted shortly after in 1996. This concludes our tour of what is more than likely the largest and most prototypically accurate representation of the once expansive network of CN branch lines in Midwestern Ontario. Long linear runs, accurate track plans, prototypical scenery and structures, all over multiple levels, gives operators a chance to really slow down and experience the rural Ontario landscape in 187 scale. This layout so accurately reflects the character of the rural landscape of Canadian National's branch lines in the area. When one walks into the layout room, they are instantly transported back to 1977. This is how things were. Thanks again for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed this video and the opportunity to witness a piece of railroad history as seen through the eyes of a master model railroader. While the layout owner has made a recent move, the layout is already being rebuilt and reimagined. I offer a very special thanks to the man that brought this to life and shared it with us. Until next time, Slayton Sub out.